So as you are making your way back to your seats, I'd like to make an introduction. David Stanton is a senior advisor at USAID, where he leads a cross-functional team focused on digital health. David brings a unique perspective on the issues we've talked about today because he spent 10 years as an HIV clinic, uh, clinician and an epidemiologist before getting involved in technology and all that can be possible. There you go. That's right, we're bringing everybody, but we're slowly getting everybody back in. Here we go. But as we wrap up here, please welcome a round of applause for David Stanton. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, it's been a fabulous meeting, fat, very interesting. I don't have slides, so I'm not worried. Um, so some of you may have seen me come and go. Earlier today, uh, I had to run over to Crystal City, Virginia, where my offices are, to provide opening remarks to a session on digital health for USAID staff that are in from the field. So, and now I'm here doing closing remarks for this, and that's, that's great. I've noticed that maybe because of my age or where I am in my career, I get asked to do uh, opening and closing remarks a lot. And honestly, it is liberating, as you were about to find out. Um, sort, of, sort of in the spirit of this meeting, and I've, I've warned a few people ahead of time, this is going to be a very disruptive closing, okay? So, um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you walk out of here thinking, wow, everything came together, I get it now, I will have failed because nobody gets it. We, we, our place in history is, I think, unknown to us. We can only look back 20 years from now and, and see where we were going. But we are, we are on the cusp of doing some remarkable things that probably none of us have even thought about in this room yet. But, but the technology that is available to us is, is advancing faster than anybody that can keep up with it. The use case scenarios that we're going to be looking at um, are uh, uh, probably yet to be dreamed. So in the next, I don't know, five, ten minutes, what I'd, I'd like to talk about three things. And I said I'm going to be disruptive, and I meant it because I'm going to challenge this audience about things that haven't been talked about today. And, uh, you know, I was at a meeting on artificial intelligence and global health, and uh, I was asked, uh, you know, what would your tweet be at the end of this meeting? And um, the people sort of turned and looked at me when I said, well, my tweet is, do not let, uh, do not become so enamored of the cleverness of our technology that we overlook the unintended consequences of its use. And I, I'm going to try to, I, I'm not going to try to be a Debbie Downer here today, but I am going to put out some ideas that we need to think about as we look at the brave new world that we've been hearing about today and think about the things that have to go with that to make that world come about. So I'm going to talk about three things. Um, first is the story of the little red hen. Uh, and then the second is how the USAID and the donor community are approaching digital health. I have to talk about that, it's my job, but it's really interesting. And then, and then finally, sort of to start or suggest an honest conversation about the tilt of the playing field, because we have to have that conversation. So the little red hen, and maybe many of you have heard this story, but I'll recap it for you. The little red hen is a farm animal with all her farm animal friends, and she discovers a pile of grains of wheat. And she's thinking, wow, I could plant all this, grow wheat, harvest the wheat, grind it into flour, we could bake bread. I love bread. To her friends, who's going to help me plant the wheat? And the friends are all, ah, I'm too busy. I've got other things I want to do. She plants the wheat all by herself. It grows because they, they use that IBM s satellite thing, you know, looking on it, and they got all the bugs off it and everything. And she says, it's time to harvest the wheat. Who's going to help me harvest the wheat? Nobody has time for that. She says, okay, she harvests the wheat by herself. Who's going to help me grind the wheat? You guess. Nobody's interested. She grinds the wheat into flour. Who's going to help me bake the bread? 
No one is interested. The bread is, the bread is baked, comes out of the oven, smells great, looks good. Who's going to help me eat it? All the hands go up. Bread in this story is a metaphor for data. And everybody wants the data. Everybody wants to look at it, analyze it, play with it. And I can tell you, out of it's just the love in my heart, USAID has a steady parade of academicians, private sector companies, non-governmental organizations that tell us we can analyze your data for you. We would love to look at your data. We will tell you things you never thought you could know if we could just get your data. And, you know, and, and I, I think we're at a point in time where it's like, that would be cool, but we need data. We need data that are repeatable and reliable. Does everybody know the FAIR acronym? FAIR data, findable, accessible, interoperable, Reliable, repeatable. We need that in the health sector in developing countries. And while there's this rush to do big data to apply artificial intelligence to it, we need this foundational uh, piece of, of, of the building block that gets us to the gee whiz of the big data and the analytics. And so that brings me to what USAID and other donors are working on right now. Because what we are trying to build is the thing you need if you want to do the sexy stuff. You need a foundation of a health system that is able to collect data and keep it going and keep it correct. And the, the, the last few years have been really um, earth-shaking in that the, the donor community came together. Uh, it started at a, a meeting on digital health in Africa where we convened in the UK, convened by Wilton Park, and we had a side meeting among the donors, us, the UK, the Norwegians, Swedes, others. And, and we, we had heard this story about the fragmentation of the health information systems in sub-Saharan Africa. Then in 2012, the government of Uganda had to put a moratorium on donors coming in and building information systems in their health sector because there were 54 operating health sector information systems at play at that time. None of them talked to each other. And, and we all said, you know, we were all looking at our shoes and saying, mea culpa. Tanzania, over 100 different health information systems brought in by a variety of donors. It's the U.S. government and a variety of agencies in the U.S. government, all the other donors, various NGOs. Everybody said, we, we're, all, we're all responsible. We've got to stop doing this. This isn't working. We're spending a lot of money, and we don't know what we are getting for it. My metaphor this is we let a thousand flowers bloom, none of them were interoperable. So the, the, the donor community got together a few months later, just the donors behind closed doors. It wasn't a secret meeting, everybody knew we were having it, but we got together and we said, what, you know, how do we turn this ship, how do we do this differently? And we came up with a set of principles. It's called the, the, the Donor Alignment Principles for, for Digital Health. And it's on a website that you can look at. Just Google Donor Alignment Principles. You can pull out your phone and do it while I talk. I don't care. Um, but but it's, it's, it's very fundamental. And it's based on actually some of the lessons that we took from the early days of the response to the AIDS epidemic. And we basically said, um, one, the donors are going to work together. But more importantly, we're going to build the capacity of the countries that we're working with. And more importantly, we are going to align ourselves around a single strategy, rather than parachuting in with our solutions, and, and as brilliant as they are, leaving them disconnected and the white elephants as we walk away five years later. So we said we are going to align ourselves around a, a, um, a, a single national strategy, we're going to support the, the capacity building that's necessary to do that. We're going to support the construction of the, the documentation that it needs, the, the governance documents, the architecture documents, and, and a variety of other things about, you know, making sure that people are accountable for money that is spent, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this is now the new North Star for us. We're still turning the ships. You heard Bonnie talk this morning about big ships turn slowly. But we are, we are now st all starting to align to this strategic view of how the donors will work in the developing world. 
And what we are hoping will come from that is a system that is robust, that is probably not built to last forever, because nothing is, but something that will last longer than anything we've built before. And, it's, and, and something that is willing, that is willing, that is able to accept um, new technologies and new use cases as it comes along because it was built for the future and not just for a single case use. So that's, that's sort of where we, where we are, USAID. Um, is in the uh, painfully slow bureaucratic process of putting out a policy paper on this topic. Uh, we are somewhere between, we have finished the sort of the re legally required internal consultation. There will be an external consultation. The document will be uh, out in, in the world for people to tell us what they think and suggest and, and hopefully that you'll love it. Um, but I do want to say that, you know, the, the, what we're, what we're um, what we're trying to do is, is, is align around four principles, and I, I've alluded to some of them, but they all come out of this sense of the, um, the journey to self-reliance and building health informatic systems that can, that can last without a donor's input. And so in order to do this, we're gonna, we're gonna prioritize building capacity at the local level, aligning to the single, national strategy, building an enterprise architecture that can survive the, the next iteration of whatever technology is going to come along that is, it is not, is reasonably future-proof. And then fourth, what I haven't mentioned is the use of global goods. And I've talked to a few people here today about global goods. But what we're talking about is tried and true open source uh, solutions that can be applied that don't necessarily shackle a developing country to a dozen or more different eternal licensing agreements with the private sector. The, the, some of the biggest pieces of software that are available now that are being used are the DHIS2, which is a, a public health data aggregating software package. It's open source. That doesn't mean it's, it's easy and free and cheap for a country to use, but it does mean that it, it is license free and it does mean that it can be adapted to a country's needs. And it is not like a package that requires renegotiating a language if you want to get in and play with the code. Another, another example of this is OpenLMIS, which is a logistics management information system. There, there, are, there are global goods for insurance billing, there are global goods for electronic patient records, and what we are trying to do is support the development and testing so that these are tried and true and available to countries around the world to assemble a fairly robust information system. So that's, that's where we are, that's our aspiration. It's gonna take us some time to get there, but the, the alternative, the status quo is untenable. Uh, it, we've, we, we can no longer, as a, as a donor community, continue to support the, the investments in the fragmented, fragmented systems that we've been working with. The other thing that this does is we've heard a lot about really interesting applications of new technologies. And there's, there's a lot of things out there that we would love to do. I mean, WHO has actually recommended using cell phone based ways to contact pregnant women to remind them they have a, a clinic visit coming. That's incredible. For that to work, you have to have a database that says, we know who the pregnant women are. We know, how, we know their names, we know how to contact them, what clinic they need to come to, and when their appointment is. So you have to have this boring, non-sexy foundation if you want to bring on the cool gee whiz stuff. So we're all with you with the cool gee whiz stuff, but we are really trying to build something that really supports and makes all that possible. So I'm going to change gears just a little bit. And turn to what I said was to start an honest conversation about the tilt of the playing field. The playing field is not level. And the countries that we're working with are waking up to the fact that I think a lot of you know is that data is valuable. Data is very valuable. It may be as valuable, it may even in the future be more valuable than the mineral wealth under the ground. And there is a, uh, I, I think, a discouraging sense of um, entitlement to those data from, from those who do not live in those countries. And I see this in our own implementing partners, I see this in academia, I see it in the private sector, 
and it sort of goes like this. You don't know the value of it. You don't know how to use it. You don't have the resources to use it. We can take care of that. That is not the journey to self-reliance. That's the journey to dependency. And we have to really drill down on uh, data use agreements, on understanding data sovereignty, and I maintain that good fences make good neighbors and good data use agreements will get us to the kinds of big data uses that we would like to, but it will fall apart if countries start uh, clamping down on the use of their health system data because we have taken the data without proper authority, without proper permissions. So I, I, I want to bring up a couple things. One. Uh, a cautionary, and I'm going to end on a. Po I promise I'm going to end on a very positive note. Um, the, the consequences of of data of of open data. A year or so ago, there was a the, a symposium at Harvard University on artificial intelligence and global health, and there was just one of those moments where somebody went to the microphone, asked a question. It didn't really get answered, but the question was earth-shaking. And the question was, does open data make inequality worse? Does it widen the gap? The answer was, the question was never answered. They moved on. It was talking about publication or something. But I, I call your attention to um, a blog post that was written by Sabina Leonelli. She's at the University of Exeter, is published in the London School of Economics Business Review. The title is, Without Urgent Action, Big Data May Widen Inequality. And in this blog, she points out three concerns that she has. Some of them are not applicable to development necessarily, but I think they're all things we need to think about. One is, the, the first is there's an uh, there's unsustainable digital landscape and the urgent need to find business models that can support data storage, sharing, and analysis. Everybody has data, but if we're going to bring data into data lakes and into uh, systems that can pull data from disparate places and analyze it and use it. We need a place to put those data. We need a third party that is trusted and has the, the capacity to make data available on a, uh, and, and, and manage and govern the access to the data. We don't have this. What I see happening, though, is bespoke systems that say, well, I want this, this, this data, and we'll, we'll sign all the papers, we can put it there, and I can analyze and get what I want out of it. But there really isn't a system to pull these things together to really realize the promise of big data. The second is, no surprise, the quality and credibility of the data themselves. We generate the data quickly, but uh, data cleaning takes probably 10 times the time it takes to collect it but it has to be done. The third concern is, is probably the one that, that worries me the most, and, and that is around the extent to which big and open data are reinvo reinforcing existing social divides. For instance, by, by reinforcing data sources that represent only privileged individuals or societies and communities. Uh, we've seen this in the, art, in the, uh, the, the uh, facial recognition software where facial recognition software has been trained on Caucasian faces, doesn't do very well with, with people of color. Uh, we've seen this in uh, a, a brilliant company that demonstrated an artificial intelligence system for diagnosing illness, but it's based on, you know, if, if, you, if you Google it itches here, what do you get? It's based on self-selected, so basically, they've done machine learning on hypochondriacs, and, and and, and that's useful, but what you need is, is machine learning on a broad swath of humanity and not just those who are willing to uh, list their symptoms. And these are the things that have to be fixed. And so the fix is one, it has to be done urgently. The other fix is substantial investments in data governance and stewardship. We're investing a lot in software, hardware, technology. We need to invest in the policy side of this equation. What are the material transfer agreements for the 21st century? Material transfer agreements in the past used to cover the transport of blood samples and paper out of a country to another. How do you govern the transfer of digital information? And we really need to tackle that, and I don't think we've got a handle on that, but that needs a big, a big investment. We need to support fairness in data handling. We need to understand that you know, the, the journey to self-reliance means we respect the autonomy of the countries we work with. 
uh, we need to invest in adequate data expertise and skills. Uh, clearly, I mean, in our own, uh, in my own setting, we need to invest in that, but we need to invest in countries' ability to analyze and use the data themselves. They can't be beholding on some other entity coming from outside to come in and tell them what's going on. They need to be able to know what's going on in their own country. And then we need, finally, the development of intelligent and ethical strategies for data sharing. So that's the, the first uh, issue I wanted to raise sort of from, from academia. The second is, I think, the positive one. And this is the concept of digital civics. Digital civics is a long-term research program uh, led by the Open Lab at Newcastle University in the UK. And they're exploring how digital technologies can empower citizens and communities. Um, it is citizen-driven design. So the research is being applied to education, public health, social care, local democracy, and a variety of other areas. A lot of what we're talking about is data systems that are driven by the top for the top. I'm a public health expert. I need to know everybody that has a cough in Washington, D.C., and I can tell you what's going on here. That is, that's fabulous, and I'm not criticizing that, but that is not the only way we can develop digital systems that benefit communities. And what digital civics does is it's citizen-derived design. It works on things like social care, community public health, education, local democracy, and they answer questions that are not earth-shaking. They will never get published globally, but it's like, where's the best place to put the bike lanes in my community? What's the future of our parks and open spaces? How do we improve mental health services in our community? And so these aren't the big data applications that are exciting, but they actually have immediate impact on people's lives. Usually it's measurable, and, and people will notice that it's made a difference, and it's empowering. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm going to stop being disruptive and, and thank all of you. And, 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 and again, thank you to Premise. You brought my boss here. She was smiling when she came in. She was smiling when I left. Oh, thank you so much for that. Um, but just to say that we all see the massive opportunities in front of us. We're not quite sure what we have in our hands, but we know we have something big. And all I'm saying is that without a new rule book, we will fall short of the promise of these new technologies. So let's focus on the, the, let's focus on the, uh, the brilliance of our, of our technology, but let's also not lose sight that these technologies can go astray and we can make some poor decisions. Let's, let's move forward in both the technological side and also on the policy and the ethical side. And with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Okay, how about a, one more round of applause for David Stanton, USAID. Well, what an amazing afternoon, great day. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this first ever disrupting development. Uh, we look forward to doing it again in the future. Please join us over here for some cocktails and conversation afterwards, and uh, we look forward to next year. Thank you, guys.